So here we are almost at the uh, winter solstice and uh, most definitely my favorite time of the year. One of my passions is to go winter trekking, historic trekking, so using only 18th century accoutrements. And two of the items that are essential for that are the snowshoe and the toboggan, both gifted to us by the indigenous people on this continent, certainly predating European contact by a long shot. So the one uh, toboggan I have here that I built a few years ago is my solo trekking one. And what it allows me to do is to carry an extra blanket. So I can carry in my burden strap, I can carry two uh, full four point blankets, but a third one's almost impossible, too bulky, too heavy. So it allows me to carry a piece of canvas, an extra blanket, a few more accoutrements that I would not normally take if I was carrying it on my back. If conditions are right, it's ideal. If the conditions are wet snow, fairly warm winter conditions, it can be quite a slog and then you wish it was on your back. So I'm going to be building a larger one for a bigger group of people. Um, as I say, this one's pretty, pretty much um, one for solo trekking. You'll notice it's quite narrow. The purpose of that is it, it will stay inside of the snowshoe tracks so you don't get it tipping over and dumping your cargo. The one I'm going to build is going to be about six to eight feet long, probably about eight feet long in the body and just a tad, a tad wider and it would accommodate four people. Uh, winter camping has a lot of risks that, um, that summer camping certainly doesn't have. Um, when you add only 18th century accoutrements, you're a increasing that risk. And when you go solo, you're really increasing it. So one has to be extremely careful in everything you do. It has to be very methodical. Um, in terms of daylight, one's pretty restricted to about seven to eight hours. So if you're up, strike your camp, get moving fairly early. If you're alone, one has to stop about one to two o'clock in the afternoon. Any later than that, um, it's gonna get dark on you. you know, literally be blacker than the inside of a cat. So you need to set up shelter. You need to cut boughs for bedding because you've got to get your body off the ground or you're gonna be very cold. And you have to cut a lot of firewood. And I found over the years that when you have enough firewood that you think will last the night, double it. As I did have one experience a few years ago where in the middle of the night, I ran out of firewood and um, it was a new moon. So it literally was dark. Um, having only one candle that I use for my fire lighting in my fire lighting kit, um, it doesn't give me any light. So I was out in, in, I don't know what time it was in the night, scrounging around trying to find enough firewood to survive till morning. Anyway, with four people is ideal, um, two to four, because when you come to a site that you're going to um, pitch your camp, uh, one person starts a fire immediately, gets the billy on for tea. One person starts to build a shower um, shelter and two people go off to gather firewood. So it's a lot, a lot quicker. It gives you about an extra hour or so in the day that you can trek because you've got all that, that uh, help, all those hands doing the work. Anyway, I'm going to go off to the bush. I'm going to find a nice cedar, nice clear cedar. And we're going to do a little video on how to construct a traditional native uh, toboggan. So we're um, splitting out our planks for the toboggan this morning. Uh, again, we're going to use cedar, light, easy to work with. Um, there's a bit of a trick to it uh, to find uh, wood that's going to be relatively straight grained is you can peel a bit off the off the bark at the bottom of the tree and give it a rip upwards. If the bark follows straight in a relatively straight line, the inside grain of the wood will be straight. It's really essential for uh, canoe building. So uh, when you're going to pull these planks out by hand, you're basically following the, uh, the grain structure. Uh, so you want it pretty straight. Um, so with rib bending in canoes, for example, it has to be almost perfectly straight. This one's not quite as good and we really don't care that it'll be adequate for our toboggan. So I split the log in half and then the halves into quarters, the quarters into eights. I split the eights. So essentially the rule of thumb is you half everything. So half the tree, half the quarter, half the eighth, and you carry on. So I'm just gonna finish this one. Then we're going to uh, try to draw it out a bit thinner using our fro. 
I've almost got this one done. So now we're going to take the fro and uh, split that out in half again. Okay, so I got uh, two planks done, working on the third. Uh, I haven't quite decided whether it's going to be four or five planks wide. Probably four. Again, I want to keep it pretty narrow so it stays in the snowshoe tracks. So basically what I'm doing is making a long canoe rib here, the same process. Uh, what I do is basically make one side flat first. Uh, how I do that is I put a bevel on each side, and then I have a reference point. And then basically I remove all the wood in the middle till I've got a reasonably flat surface and then I just eye the edge it doesn't have to be that accurate and I want to try to keep uh, both sides parallel it really doesn't matter how wide it is whether it's two inches wide or three inches wide just keeping them parallel so yeah again I'm losing my light there's not enough hours in the day so I'm going to finish up this one uh, I'll have to call it the date go we'll start my fire and cook up my supper.
I think I've got enough of those made now. So those will be my cross pieces. So flat on the bottom, it'll sit on the top of the planks for the toboggan. And then I'm gonna to try to uh, punch a hole through these uh, for each of the boards, corresponding boards below. Feeling that'll burn hole, if that's not gonna work, if it's gonna split out my material. Now, typically they made the ties for toboggans were made from rawhide. And I have made them out of rawhide. The only problem with it is if rawhide gets wet, anybody that has a native drum knows when there's high humidity, the drum gets all wonky and you have to dry it out. So the rawhide, will just it's just like wire when it's dry. But if, uh, if it's wet conditions like today, it's can't, can't decide whether it's snowing or raining, that rawhide will loosen up. And so the canoe will get kind of wobbly. The canoe, sorry. The toboggan will get kind of wobbly. Um, so I'm going to use snare wire this time around, make a, a, a little more rigid thing than something that they would have had. So I've got a fire going over here. I'm going to get uh, my big pot on and uh, I'm going to start steaming the plank. You can see in the backdrop here, I've done from all planed out here. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got the toboggan boards uh, steamed and uh, bent to the shape we want. This is going to be like sketches I've seen of the old Algonquin style toboggans. So we're going to leave this cure for the night. Just let her dry out. Probably freeze up tonight. Anyway, who would have thought that our our log cabin in the process would become the perfect jig for this? 
So tomorrow, um, yeah, we should be able to take this off, get our cross members on, and uh, yeah, we've got to braid a bit of uh, hemp rope, which we'll use for the cargo straps on it, and we'll be all done from uh, tree to toboggan in about a day and a half. So we're putting in our last uh, cross piece in the, in the toboggan. And as I mentioned earlier, we decided to use snare wire instead of um, uh, sinew, which we could have used, or I should say rawhide, uh, just a whole lot less maintenance. I decided to split out a piece of white ash here, a little bit tougher than the cedar members I've been using. It's gonna be under quite a bit of stress once I put the curl in it. I'm trying to reproduce uh, an old style Algonquin toboggan and the sketches that I've seen don't show as you think of a modern toboggan with that bend over complete curve in the front. They basically had a slight pitch to the front just to allow it to clear the snow. And of course they were always dragged behind the snowshoes. So the snowshoes essentially set the track for the, for the toboggan. So I'm gonna finish this guy up here and uh, I've been using, you know, I've mentioned before how I like using old tools. Well, these aren't old, but they're certainly a really good reproduction of a pair of pliers that uh, a hunter would have carried in his shooting bag. So they're hand forged, they're hot riveted. Um, and yeah, they're, uh, as I say, they're pretty accurate reproduction. So basically we're going to get our wire up in here. And before we pull the wires right up tight, we're gonna put a slight groove on the bottom of the toboggan for the wires to fit in. So we don't want drag and we, we don't want the snare wire to wear. So we're gonna put a slight groove as I've done in all the previous ones. Doesn't have to be very much. It just gets that wire down below the surface uh, that will be sliding on the snow. So I'll finish this guy up here. So that recesses that wire and uh, that'll make her slide a lot easier in the ground and last a little longer. That's my blood. I think a bit of blood on this toboggan. There, that is the last piece of wire. So the last step, and I've done it in all these other ones, 
I'm going to drive over these these little twists I've got so that my cargo doesn't get caught on it and it rip my my shelter canvas or my wool blanket. So we're just going to pound these guys down, sort of recess them into the wood. So I'm going to get my water set back up, which fell over, and uh, we're going to do the last steaming, tie it up. And uh, the only thing I got to do to make this a working toboggan is uh, braid a bit more of this hemp cord for the pole line. And we're all set. So I've all but uh, completed my Algonquin toboggan. I have to uh, braid a little more hemp cord, get that attached to the pole rope, and I've got to wax the bottom with some beeswax, and it'll be set to go for my winter trekking. Uh, we think of the toboggan today as a toy. In the 17, 18, well into the early 1900s, it was an essential tool. The indigenous peoples would uh, disperse in the fall uh, into smaller groups, quite often family groups, uh, for their winter hunting grounds. And they referred to those months sometimes, some years, uh, as the hungry moons. And so when they would deplete uh, the large game, which sustained them in the area that they were camped in, they would have to follow the game. And they would use the toboggan as the tool to carry their gear, to set up temporary camps, and to bring the meat back to their permanent winter camp once they harvested it. Our European settlers um, were the same. There's a lot of first-person accounts of 
settlers um, going for months on end where their only sustenance came from what they could take from the forest. So, and they use the toboggan as well. So I'm uh, pretty excited to get out there and trek. It's raining like heck today and you can hear it on the roof, I'm sure. So I'm gonna get this flipped over. I'm gonna get the bottom wax and uh, I'm gonna hope this rain turns into snow so I can actually use this thing. <laughs> 